Okay, we are in the Gospel of John, and we are in the fifth session, and we're doubling up this time. We're going to take two chapters, at least we're going to give it a try, uh, to catch up with ourselves. And so we're going to explore chapters four and five, for those of you that are going to follow in your own text, which we encourage. In chapters four and five, we're going to encounter the following. We're going to have three healings. We're going to find four specific witnesses. And we're going to talk about two different resurrections. So these are things to watch for as you go and you make your notes and what have you. So let's just jump into John chapter 4, verse 1. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, then we have a parenthesis explaining here, though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples did. He left Judea and departed again into Galilee. You'll discover that John focuses primarily on Jesus' whereabouts in Judea. The other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, tend to emphasize what he did in the Galilee. John is sort of the other way around, but here we're finding one of the exceptions when he is leaving Judea and going to Galilee. And uh, he obviously is getting very, very popular, and both Matthew and Mark also emphasize that at this point. And so he departed to the Galilee, and the Galilee while a Jewish area also is a, has a lot of contact with the Gentiles, we'll see. And so, why did he leave Judea? A lot of speculation. One is to avoid confrontation with the Pharisees. We've already seen them starting to align against him. We're going to see more of that before this uh, section is over. He has a ministry in Samaria, and that would deserve some comment which we'll deal with, because that's not a Jewish area. It's a half-Jewish area, and I'll explain what I mean when we get there. Uh, he also, some people speculate, to avoid imprisonment because John the Baptist is about to be imprisoned. And uh, that's, things are getting tense in that regard. Uh, and, but the real reason he left is that he was led by the Spirit. So each one of those has a scriptural support. They're all defendable. But when you get to verse 4, it's a very short but provocative verse because it says, and he, Jesus that is, he must needs go through Samaria. And so this is not an option. This is not an accident. This is not just a circumstances. This is some kind of commitment that's involved here. And uh, he wasn't in a hurry. The trip took two days. And so he has an agenda. And we want to remember that, by the way. Most things that Jesus accomplishes are at his initiative, and they always have a defined purpose. And this encounter, we're going to get ourselves involved here. He's got a date, by the way. She didn't know it, but he knew it. He's going to meet a gal. And the encounter was predestined. And that's true of every one of us. Every one of us in this room that have, have come to discover who Jesus really is did so because of his initiative, something we don't ever want to lose sight of. It's his work, it's his initiative, and what he starts, he finishes. So a little background on Samaria. That's a term we throw around. The city was the capital of the northern kingdom when it went bad, but there's much more to it than that. This was a province that was given to Ephraim and the half-tribe of Manasseh in the days of Joshua, back in Joshua 16 to 17. That's all recorded in there. And after the northern tribes revolted, when Solomon died, the northern kingdom revolted, and uh, the inhabitants of this district generally ceased to worship at the temple in Jerusalem. And... Uh, and uh, Jeroboam, who was in charge, was in, encouraged that. He didn't want his people worshiping down there. So he, they embra em embraced uh, idolatry and a lot of other things. And uh, so that was introduced by J Jeroboam the first, if you will. And uh, now they then fell easy prey to Gentile corruptions introduced by his successors. So as history goes on, the fact that they no longer were uh, committed to the temple in Jerusalem and so forth they went a different way. And uh, ultimately, the Assyrian Empire takes them captive, takes them away. The Assyrian Empire had a policy when they captured people was to commingle their captives from their different regions to break down their ethnic commitments. So what they would do is the, the people that when they, they captured in the northern kingdom, they would take them to other parts of the Assyrian Empire and they would take captives from there and bring, they would commingle. That would cause, that the intent was to break down the ethnic commitments and it was very effective. And so, uh, so they uh, planted in this region uh, uh, various uh, nationalities. And so uh, 
This then created a strange mix of Jewish traditions to some extent, but commingled with lots of other things. So that creates, that starts us at the background of what we mean today by a Samaritan, who is not, he's sort of Jewish, but not quite. Some people call them half Jews in a sense, and you'll see, we'll get into that a little bit more here. And uh, now, when the southern kingdom got captured by Babylon, and after 70 years they, re they return, uh, uh, the Samaritans tried to enter into an alliance with the returning Jews from Babylon. But they didn't uh, buy that, and that caused a bitterness that got worse and worse between them. And so uh, uh, later on, Manasseh, son of Judah, the high priest, contrary to their own laws, married the daughter of Sanballat, the chief of the Samaritans. And uh, so the, uh, when the Jews insisted that Manasseh should either repudiate his wife or renounce his sacred office, he fled to his father-in-law, who gave him honorable reception. And by permission of Alexander the Great, no less, uh, he built a temple to yod -Heh -Vav -Heh, the, the the Jewish god, but on Mount Gerizim, in which Manasseh and his posterity officiated as high priests in rivalry to the divinely instituted ritual in Jerusalem. So they're sort of going back to Jewishness, but they're not, they're trying to avoid the temple of Jerusalem, so they've, they're, they're creating their own view, version of all this, which causes great confusion in the minds of the people. Where, do, where should we worship? That's going to come up in our uh, thing here in a minute. See, the Samaritans claimed that they were the true Israel, and they had a temple of their own on Mount Gerizim, and that they, st they still offer Torah blood sacrifices. The Samaritans accept the Torah, the five books of Moses. They don't accept the rest of the Bible. They have their own versions of things. And so, uh, see, they're actually descendants of the heathen colonists from five Mesopotamian cities who had adopted the worship of yod uh, And uh, Yahweh, some people say it's Yahweh. Some, most rabbis just pronounce the letters rather than to pronounce the, the name that they regard is not pronounceable. So you may find me, uh, Yahweh is a very common way of saying it. I'll usually use the rabbinical thing of just using letters, yod heh vav -Heh, but uh, that's just the Hebrew. And uh, so the rabbis, by the way, say to eat bread with a Samaritan was like eating swine's flesh. If you know how they feel about pigs, you can understand how nasty a crack that is. Um, you'll notice that what comes here, Jesus avoids these ethnic-oriented debates. Instead, he focuses on what he really, his agenda, which is a little different. So, okay, we got down, we're now at uh, verse 5. Then cometh he, that is Jesus, to a city of Samaria, <clears throat> which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now, Jacob's well was there. Uh, Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. Now, the Jewish reckoning started at sun, uh, sunrise, so the sixth hour is noon, by our reckoning. Okay. And uh, so he was wearied. That may surprise you. Can Jesus get wearied? Of course. He became a man. He, can get, he gets hungry. He gets tired. Um, and so uh, thirsty, what have you. And uh, so, but Jesus always meets the need of whoever he meets, and we're going to find himself uh, dealing with this in a very interesting way. So he's at Jacob's well, and the, G the, Samar the Samaritans revered Jacob because they felt they were linked to him through Joseph. So that's an area of common uh, belief between them. But okay, we're at noon here. And uh, okay. Now, Sychar, by the way, the word means purchased. El Askar, the city in the plain of Sukkar, near the spring of Sankar, is close to Shechem, close to Jacob's well at the foot of Mount Ebal. If you, and uh, the word Shechem, by the way, pronounced just a little differently, means falsehood. It's a city of liars. And the uh, word Shechar is liquor, but it's a city of drunkards. So those terms are charged. You can make all kinds of derogatory puns out of them if you choose. And uh, so uh, Shechem actually means portion. And that's the land that Jacob gave Joseph, who was later buried there, it turns out, if you follow that in Genesis 33 and 48 and so on. But we're going to encounter now this famous woman, the Samaritan woman at the well. And this will be the first of three healings we'll encounter. And uh, so, now you've got to realize Jesus was a Jew. And these are Samaritans. And uh, you probably have no ability to grasp 
how the Jews looked at non-Jews, let alone Samaritans. The word Roya means dog and Gentile. They had a very, very um, adverse attitude to Gentiles, and they looked upon Samaritans as halfway there. They were despised. They were. They didn't deal. That's why this gal is going to be surprised at Jesus' approach to her. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water, which is also strange. When did the women usually get the water? First thing in the morning. Why is she here at noon? She's probably an outcast. Give to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. Because his disciples had gone away into the city to buy meat or food. So his disciples are off on Aaron. He's there alone. Give me some water. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, asketh drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. So that's the setup. That's the context, okay? And what he's doing here was rabbinically prohibited, by the way. And so she's surprised, understandably. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Now he's obviously speaking metaphorically here, but she's not picking up on that. that uh, that's just We're just moving along here. And uh, living water. Living water actually means like running water, like a drain, but it also can, it, it, uh, it hooters soon. It's, uh, it's, it's living water. It's a fountain of life is the flavor of it. And uh, Jacob's well itself is about 30 to 50 feet deep, something like that. It's fed by rainwater percolating into a cistern, which is good, but it's still not running water, which was preferred. So that's a way, that's another thing she could be confusing here. Here, The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with. And the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? So she's she's obviously bewildered by his uh, his metaphor here. And uh, our father Jacob. See, they, the Samaritans had that in common, and uh, they believed they were descendants of Jacob through Joseph. Now the ter- whole term of water is one of these. I'm not going to, as we did in the first few chapters in John, we spent some time chasing down the crucial metaphors. And I'm fighting the temptation to do that with water. I, should, I don't need to. The word water has a pretty, it's pretty comfortable to most of us a metaphor. Water is the fundamental necessity of life. It produces growth. It's used for cleansing. It's used for refreshing. And it's used for satisfaction in life, both literally and metaphorically. So we don't have to badger this, I don't think. We have the flavor of it. Okay. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. And by the way, you can put that on every appetite you have. Any appetite you have will always end up being unsatisfied. This is just a, a philosophical point, but going on. Whoso drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. That got her attention. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Wow. Okay, this is, this is going in a very different direction, obviously. And... Uh, one of the questions you can put in your notebook and think about, is that true of you? Do you have that experience too? You want to think that through. Shall never thirst. Okay. Actually, in the Greek, it's a double negative. In English, that's a reversal. In Greek, it's an emphatic. Never ever is what it says in effect. And that's the strongest possible construction in the Greek. Never thirst. And... Uh, and that's, that's, a, that's an allusion to eternal security. And I'm going to behave myself and not get into that subject because we're going to nail that when we get to John chapter 10. So we'll move on now. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. So she's understand there's something bigger afoot here, and she's all in for it. And Jesus said unto her, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. Go get your husband. We'll talk about it. Okay? That's a little sarcastic, by the way. Um, 
the word go there is hubaga, which is the present active imperative. Um, basically, she needs to confront her own sin. And for the first time, she, the woman began to discuss spiritual issues from this. Go call thy husband. <laughs> the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Really? I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands. And he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that saidst thou truly. Now she is so shocked by this, this isn't just something that would be in the small town rumor mill. This is something she is shocked that he would have any knowledge of. There's, in her twist here, you realize how deep this thing really goes. The one saith unto him, <laughs> I like this, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. And if you're an American, you say, No kidding, Dick Tracy. You know, I mean, it's pretty obvious. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. You know, it's interesting. The minute she realizes that he's got some supernatural gift here, she comes right up with whatever the current buzz is there. The thing that they argued about is where should we worship, in Mount Gerizim or in Jerusalem? You know, that, that's the current debate. If you're in certain some church circles and you discovered you had a live real prophet, you'd say, is it pre-trib or post-trib? You know, whatever the doctrinal issue is tends to be up first. Well, that's what she does. She, she gets off. Everything goes right at what is the current buzz to them. Our fathers worship in this mountain, and ye say that Jerusalem is the place we ought to worship. And so she realizes he has inside information, so she jumps right into the current doctrinal issue. And uh, Now, he temporarily defers dealing with that. He will answer it later, but he won't get distracted from the path he's on. Do you say that to her woman? Believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. In other words, neither one. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. So he straightens her out right on that, incidental to going on. But we should remember that. There's a strange thing that happened in the first century of the early church. The early church became very anti-Semitic. And uh, that was tragic for the Jew. You and I, as Gentiles, have no grasp of the tragedies perpetrated over the last 2,000 years under the banner of Christ against the Jews. The Crusaders had contests to see how many Jewish babies you could get on a sword. And we go on and on with more, one grotesque thing after another, which of course is emblazoned in the Jewish memory. Most of us Gentiles have no grasp of all of that. So it was tragic for the church to become anti-Semitic. And there's vestiges of that still today in terms of people who have... Uh, I, don't, I won't get, go down. We'll be dealing with some of that later in John. But the interesting thing is it was also tragic for the church because the church has lost its Jewish roots. Most Christians have no grasp of what Passover is really all about. They have no grasp about these, the other six feet. There are seven feasts of Moses, and every one of them is not only commemorative, it's also prophetic in some amazing ways. And uh, as you start discovering some of this, many Christians get really into all that, and some even go so far as they get back under the law, and I don't want to start on that either. But the point is there's a huge, huge value in regaining and re-understanding our roots. And uh, we'll be talking a little bit more about that as we go. Place of worship is the issue here. Jacob's well was at the foot of Mount Gerizim. And San Balan built a temple which was eventually destroyed by John Hyrcanus in about 129 B.C. The Samaritans continued to worship on the mountain. And to justify this, they noted that both Abram and Jacob had established altars there. Not that that has anything to do with anything. And Gerizim was the mountain from which the blessings in Deuteronomy 28 were proclaimed, they claimed. And according to the Samaritan Torah, it was this mountain and not Ebal where the altar was built. So they have in the Peshitta and, the, and, and some of the other documents that they lean on, uh, They've got some twists in there that they lean on. But let's move on here. Verse 23. But the hour cometh and now is, Jesus speaking, but the hour cometh and now is 
when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God seeks worship. And it's not at Mount Gerizim or Jerusalem, as he's saying here. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Not through rituals, not through procedures, no, no. Spirit to spirit. And uh, see, he, he points out the Jews had a fuller revelation. He doesn't, he doesn't sweep that under the carpet. He nails that with the Samaritans there. The Samaritans had rejected the Psalms and the prophets in their writings. Only the Torah they leaned on. In contrast, the Psalms of David, the first 72 of the 150 Psalms, were memorized by the Jews. And that's worth doing, by the way. You start looking at those. Salvation is of the Messiah. The word Christ is unfortunately, well, that's a Greek term. The Hebrew term is the Messiah, Mashiach. But anyway, the salvation is all about that. The, it's a person that was alive and that went through an a, um, ordeal on our behalf. And uh, si but both Simeon and John the Baptist highlight this uh, at that time, contemporaries, if you will. Now, the Jewish foundation, see, God, let's not forget as Christians that God chose Israel to be his the mechanism by which he's going to redeem the world. We have a Jewish Bible. Our Bible is Jewish. Uh, we, have, uh, we're, we're, we have a foundation of Jewish laws, procedures, a Jewish priesthood. The, for, the disciples, the 12 disciples, were Jewish. The early church was Jewish. Paul was Jewish, and so forth. And uh, we need to understand our roots, is my suggestion. So that's an underlying thing. And let's not ever forget that we have a Jewish Messiah that fulfilled the law for all of us. We're not under the law because he fulfilled it for us. We need to understand that. And uh, I remember Nan and I were in London and they had a stage play of Fiddler on the Roof. And uh, during the intermission, uh, a couple in front of us turned around and they saw Nan and I and our two boys, blonde-haired little kids. And the woman turned to us and says, you know, we, we, the person speaking, said, we were raised in an Orthodox Jewish home and we have trouble picking up on some of the humor in this musical. How can you, you're not Jewish, are you? How can you relate to Fiddler on the Roof? And uh, I said, we're not Jewish, but the God we worship is. And that started a conversation. I've never forgotten that. And it's very true. It's very true. And so, uh, anyway, enough of that. Okay. There are three musts that we've encountered so far in John. Ye must be born again in chapter 3. The sun must be lifted up. That was also in chapter 3. And God must be worshipped in spirit and truth in this chapter. These are some must, some, some non-optional issues coming up here. Worship is the new nature seeking its source. If you're born again, you'll have a passion, a drive, a draw to worship him in spirit and in truth, not by procedures. And uh, sa the sacrifice of the wicked is considered an abomination. The one said unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he has come, he will tell us all things. So she reiterates the con conviction that she has. And then Jesus has this incredible one-liner. I'm, I'm always stunned when I hear people say, well, Jesus never said he was God. Whoever said that hasn't opened his Bible anywhere, because it's on every page. Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. What could be clearer? You see, her concept of the Messiah is what he is saying. That's what he is. And this is astonishing. We get so used to it. Let's never, ever get comfortable with that as, as, as Christians. To realize that the Creator himself became flesh and dwelt among us. To fulfill a destiny on our behalf. Wow. Wow. Ego am I, I am. He is really going to nail this in John 8. John 8 is one of my favorite chapters. You want to see a, a uh, battle of words when Jesus takes on the Pharisees. That's a dandy. But uh, we'll save that for chapter 8. See, nothing more was needed. She had him, and so that's the key idea here. He spoke seven times, she spoke six. You could probably predict that if you're familiar with the structure here. 
Okay, let's, uh, upon this came his, now about this time the disciples show up. They're finished their shopping, they're back. Upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, what seekest thou or why talkest thou with her? In other words, they're marveled, but they, they're keeping um, quiet about it. And uh, so, it's interesting that Jesus entrusted the task of winning an entire city to a woman who had known him for less than an hour. And uh, yet she was more willing than others, who not, were no doubt maybe better trained, but didn't respond to the need. So he's going to get into that here. They marveled because they understood that it, what he was doing was forbidden. The rabbi said it was not permitted for a rabbi to talk to a woman alone. They had that issue too, aside from the Samaritan dimension to this. A woman astonished here, okay. The rabbi said, let no one talk with a woman in the street. No, not even with his own wife in the street. That was their cultural style. The woman then, notice what she does. She left her water pot. Enough already. She's on her way. The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, come see a man which told me all the things I ever did. Is not this the Christ? And she was convincing because they went out of the city and came unto him. So this is Samaria. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. See, they just got back shopping. They assumed he's hungry. Eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Again, he's speaking metaphorically. It takes the disciples a while to pick up on that. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? Jesus saith unto him, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. That's exactly what he told his parents when he was twelve, and had left the caravan, they doubled back to find him in the temple. Remember that in Luke chapter 2? Oh, wish ye not that I must be about my father's business, was his response to his parents. When he was twelve years old, he's giving them the, re the same response here. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit in the life eternal, and both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. He points out something else. This is a team deal. One person doesn't the whole job. And uh, he's going to elaborate on this here. And... Uh, and herein is that saying true. One soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. And uh, it's interesting. There are some people that are called for evangelism to introduce people to Christ. They're not necessarily the ones to close the deal. One man sows, another reaps. There are many people that try to do both. They'll have a you know, an uh, 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 altar call, you know, because the, the evangelist speaks the big thing. And, and I'm not disparaging that, but that's not the normal model. That's not the normal model. Because it, it really discovering Christ is usually a question of relationships. So the first is to introduce someone and let the Holy Spirit move. Because it's different strokes for different folks. If we had time to share our personal testimonies here in this room, we discover that they're all different. Everyone is a miracle. Some very dramatic, some very modest, but nevertheless. And trying to put that into a formula. Every, all kinds of uh, ministers have, you know, have a formula. No, no, no formula. The Lord is what it's all about. And uh, One soweth, another reapeth. I sent you to reap whereon ye bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman, which testified, he told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them. And he did. He stayed for two days, which on his schedule, is, that's, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. And many more believed because of his own word. And said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. They didn't pass out tracts. 
They just got to know him. No secondhand testimony. It wasn't hurt. That got their attention is when they heard him that they understood who he was. See, uh, testimonies are supplements, not substitutes. No exclusive formulas here. It's relationship, not religion. It's the Word, not social pressures. The Word incarnate. The Word, remember that? The Logos. We went through all that in chapter 1. Okay. And so, they had expected, we would expect worship in Jerusalem, idolatry in Samaria. What we really find here is there's idolatry in Jerusalem, we'll encounter that later, and worship in Samaria. This is, this is very inverted. Interesting. And the Savior of the world, that's interesting. This is the first time in the Bible that this, that phrase is used. So I think that's kind of interesting. I want you to notice the increments here. Notice the gradual change in attitude. Initially, he was a Jew. Then, is he greater than Jacob? Then she discovers he's a prophet. Now she discovers it's Christ himself. You see it all in steps. I want to compare a couple of things here. Remember Nicodemus? We had that whole experience in chapter 3. Here we have the Samaritan woman. Nicodemus was a man with a name. He had social position. Here's a gal who's really unnamed, first of all, and an outcast. He had good reputation. She had a bad reputation. Nicodemus was a wealthy man. She was a poor woman. He came to Jesus. Jesus came to her. Nicodemus had, was outstanding socially. She was a social outcast. Nicodemus was a Jew, in fact, a leader among the Jews, and she was a Samaritan. Nicodemus was very religious, very upright, and so forth. She was very worldly, immoral, five, uh, five um, uh, husbands and so on. No, the, Nicodemus, she had no immediate response. Here, she immediately told her whole city. And uh, Nicodemus, Jesus was blunt. Here, Jesus was tactful, and yet dealt with it head on. And uh, Nicodemus started talking about the spiritual. The Samaritan talked about physical things and then transitioned. So, okay. So now we're going to shift to the... He's on his way to Galilee. Let's pick up on Galilee now from verses 43 to 54. Now after two days he departed thence and went into Galilee. And for Jesus himself testified that a prophet hath no honor in his own country. And uh, so the... Uh, well, in John 7, someone's going to make a wisecrack out of check. There's no prophet comes out of Nazareth. Whoever said that in John 7 is wrong. There are two prophets that came out of Nazareth. One was Jonah and one was Nahum. Both came out of Nazareth, by the way. And so, for what it's worth, not a big deal. But now we're going to encounter the second healing. This is a nobleman's son. And when it says nobleman there, that implies he was somehow linked to Herod. He's not a Jewish prince. That's a different thing. It's not a nobleman. A nobleman would be someone either because of his office or because of his bloodline was Herodian, the king at the time. Then when he was coming to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things that he did at Jerusalem at the feast. For they, for they also went unto the feast. So Jesus came again unto Cana of Galilee, where he made water into wine. He's just reminding you what happened back in chapter 2, remember? And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. Understand the geography. Um, he is at uh, Cana. He's not at Capernaum. The nobleman has his base in Capernaum. But he encounters him at Cana. So there's at least... we're not. The location of Cana is under some scholastic dispute, where it's commonly presumed it's about four, at least a, a minimum of four hours, maybe more. So it's not that close. But he, but he, his base is the, the sun, and his base is in Capernaum, and this is occurring in uh, Cana. The word nobleman is a basilikos, which implies it's a term reserved with someone closely connected with the king, bloodline or by office. And uh, so uh, I've mentioned that. When he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea unto Galilee, he went unto him. See, Cana is still considered in Galilee, even though it's not Capernaum. And besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then Jesus said unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. So he's 
d suggesting a s basic skepticism here. Signs and wonders. We never see wonder used of itself for miracles performed by Jesus or his disciples. So this is repeated several times in the, in the Bible. But it tends, the term tends to denote a failure of perception on the part of those who witness those miracles. That's a, it's a skeptical term, if you will. In the Old Testament, we see it all through the Old Testament. In the, uh, uh, we see here, we see the verbs see and believe are in the plural, which implies Jesus saying that for the benefit of the crowd, not directly to him, but for the crowd. By the plural, it's tip you off on that. And remember in Mark, help my unbelief. That's a valid request. And we know that from the scripture that his word will not return void. So let's see what happens here. We're going to see the faith of a Gentile nobleman's son. And uh, the nobleman said unto him, Sir, come down ere my, my child die. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed it. The man believed the word that Jesus had spoken to him, and he went his way. So, isn't that simple? Let's understand that. He's a Gentile. And and he, he, he thought Jesus would have to come and just uh, take care of. Great. Very parallel to the centurion in Luke. Similar situation. And uh, father for his son. You know, it's interesting. Discover the first grave ever dug was for a young man. The first one who died was a son, not a father. That's when Cain killed Abel. It's interesting how Faith is mentioned twice, verse 15-53. The first is an example of salvation to all who believe. It's an example all the way through. And notice it's a four-hour trip from Kana to Karana. The father doesn't even go home. That's what happens later. As he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. And he inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend. And they said to him, Yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. And he figures out that was when he was talking to Jesus. Yesterday. So it's great news. He, his servants tell him, By the way, your son's doing great. And when, when did you first know that? Well, yesterday. And at the seventh hour. One hour afternoon. And so... Uh, he didn't even go home that day. That's confidence. You know, you think you'd go at least and check, right? Okay. Another interesting observation, you notice in the New Testament, Gentiles are always healed from a distance. I think that's interesting. That was true. Of the, that was the centurion's situation too. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in the which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth. And he himself believed in his whole house. This is again the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea into Galilee. So both the first and second are associated with Cana, even though it happened in Capernaum. Fine. Okay. This is the only example that John chooses of the Galilean ministry. He's really focused on Judea. We'll see that more and more. Um, uh, over half his gospel is the last week of Jesus' life, and uh, a third of the gospel is the last is a 24-hour period. So we're going to see. John is just taking a few selecting, selected examples here to summarize a whole ministry. And uh, the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, really go into much more depth as far as Galilee is concerned. And uh, so, okay. So one of the questions you can ask yourself is why did Jesus and John or the Holy Spirit choose to record this particular miracle? There may be lots to, of you to lots to, to mine here. I'll leave that to you to reflect and come to some possibilities. But we saw rejection here by the Jewish nation in general all through John. We accept we see acceptance, though maybe limited, by the Samaritans in John four, by the Galileans in uh, chapter four, and we're going to see a limited acceptance by the Gentiles when we get to chapter twelve. That's looking ahead. So. I want to compare two uh, healings. We had uh, uh, healings in Matthew 8 and Luke 7. Jesus was in Capernaum. Here Jesus is in Cana. In Matthew 8 and Luke 7, that issue, was they were approached by the elders, sent by the centurion, and Jesus offers to come. And the centurion says, you don't need to. My, my subordinates do what 
when I command them, you, yours will do the same. He, he, the centurion's faith was incredible. And this one, of course, Jesus tells him the son is healed. The centurion only asked Jesus to speak the word back there. The nobleman begs Jesus to come to his home, but he doesn't have to. And Jesus comments on faith in the case of the centurion. He comments on unbelief in John 4. And uh, the other one is, is later, actually, in the Galilean ministry. This is very early in the Galilean ministry. Okay. It's interesting to notice patterns. You remember when we were in Acts, we discovered that Jesus, at his ascension, says that you go to Ju Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then the uttermost parts of the world. That was the, that was the mandate in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Jerusalem... Judea, Samaria, the uttermost. You see, it was just like concentric circles. And many people have claimed that as a model of the commission that Jesus gave when he ascends in Acts chapter 1. I want you to notice that Jesus is following the same pattern here. In Jerusalem was Nicodemus, first step, chapter 3. Then Judea, the Judean ministry, chapter 4, first three verses. Then Samaria, the Samaritan woman, in chapter 4. And the uttermost be re exemplified here by the normal one's son, the, the Gentile normal one. So that same pattern is is uh, suggested here. Okay, we made it through chapter 4, and we're doing just fine. So let's go ahead and take chapter 5. This is a very key chapter in John. Uh, it has a, uh, passages here that contain the strongest arguments for the deity of Christ, that he really was God. Not just a great teacher, not just a miracle worker, not just an example, no, no his deity. Chapter 5, verse 1, And there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And now there is at Jerusalem, by the sheep market, or more technically the sheep gate, as you'd say, a pool which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. And uh, now there's a word here that deserves some comment. After this, in the Greek, that's metatauta. And uh, in the Book of Revelation, it's a key marker. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 19, there's the outline of the whole book in three parts. The things you have seen, the things which are, the things which shall be metatauta after these things. And after that, chapter 1, you have the seven letters, seven churches, the things which are. When you get to chapter, that's chapters 2 and 3, chapter 4 in Revelation is a trigger point, metatauta, and that metatauta label partitions the book of Revelation. John is using it in his gospel. Metatauta, there was a feast. He's using it as a, as a partitioner. It's one of the subtle reasons that I'm beginning to suspect that John wrote his gospel after the Patmos experience. Because it, the, 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 the structure is very similar, but more subtle. But it's again, seven, 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 seven I am statements, seven miracles, and so forth. Okay. Uh, after this, and... Uh, so, now it says a feast in your King James. Some manuscripts say the feast, so some commentators think it was Passover itself. Others say it was the Feast of Pentecost, for whatever. Um, all three were required feasts every year. Deuteronomy 16.16 16 requires every able-bodied Jew, there are three feasts, he has to come to Jerusalem. And Passover, Feast of uh, Pentecost, and Feast of Tabernacles being the three. And uh, now the Bethesda means house of mercy, by the way. And the sheep gate there is probably the sheep gate, as we know from Nehemiah 3. There are ten gates. The last one is called the judgment gate. Now the Bethesda pool we're going to encounter here is a large rectangular pool primarily for the cleaning of animals. It's about two or three feet deep, and it's about 20 to 30 feet across. And, uh, okay. Five, by the way, many people suspect is idiomatic of grace. And uh, there are five porches for, in this particular case. That porch brings it up. Uh, Benjamin's mess and Joseph and the whole thing, story of Joseph, he always got five times as much as his brothers did. He also received five pieces of raiments. Multiples of five occur all through the tabernacle. Jesus gives five loaves to the hungry and uh, the fifth clause in the prayers. And when we say five is grace, it's an inference we get by the usage of the number. It's not, not something magic about the number. Don't get mystical on it. The idea is you take a, is it five or ten, find out where else it's used, and then draw an inference on its usage. And you'll discover certain numbers seem to be used 
in certain ways. And this is, this is uh, one of the suggestions here. Anyway, going on to verse 3. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, a blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. And now we have a very, very strange uh, verse here that does not show up in the manuscripts earlier than the 3rd century. So scholars are puzzled by this verse 4. Verse 4 may have been added later as an expla explanation of a belief. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water, and whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. That's an expression of what people believed. It wasn't true. That's what makes this verse so problematical. And uh, uh, there were usually probably about 300 people around the pool at any one time, sometimes as many as 2,000 at feast time. There's never any evidence in the Bible of an angel being involved in a healing, by the way. That's why scholars are skeptical about this thing here. In fact, it's also not a biblical solution. It's a survival of the fittest kind of thing. The first guy gets in there. Gets no, this is, this is uh, uh, the whole world lies. Who's the king? Who's the uh, prince of this world? The evil one. This is a demonic thing going on here that Jesus takes advantage of, though, in effect. So verse 4 is, there's no extant Greek manuscript before 400 AD that contains these words. The earliest manuscripts omit these words. And... Uh, uh, so there, it could be just explanatory. So, okay. So we're going to encounter the impotent man here. This is healing number three of the ones we're looking for. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. Thirty-eight years this guy was incapable of walking. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? You want to get healed? Is this question right? And uh, this also, by the way, the question is going to come up. Everything in the Scripture is there for a reason. Okay, why did the Holy Spirit want you to know that this guy was in, was impotent or incapable, uh, blame, halt, whatever, for thirty eight years? Well, if you do a search on the Bible, there's only one place the word 38 comes up. And that's in Deuteronomy 2, I believe it is. Um, that's the duration that Israel wandered in the wilderness. And there is a view by some scholars that the Gospel of John, he has selected these things because they profile the history of the, the nation. The nation was halt, impotent, for 38 years. Okay, so... And with discouragement comes disbelief, of course. And so, Jesus is asking here, are you, really, are you earnestly seeking to be made well? And so, 38 years, okay. Always the sovereignty of God prevails. There were many there, but one was chosen. Jesus picked one of them. And Jesus knows his sheep, we know from John 10. And uh, the 38 years was in the wilderness after Sinai. And the Gospel of John is centered around seven miracles, and they seem to be in an order that profile the, his, the spiritual history of Israel. Interesting. The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. So he's explaining what the belief is around there. And that verse 4 seems to have been asserted so we understand that that was a belief, not that it's true. You follow me? So we suspect it was put in by a copyist. Jesus said unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And the word rise there is uh, which is a present active imperative, which is an expression like a parent to a lazy child to get up. <laughs> okay. Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. Well, that's a great scene. He didn't walk but by a miracle. Neither can you and I as a sinner repent by the same kind of, but by the same kind of miracle. We are fallen under helplessness in our condition also. There's a parallel here, not just of Israel, but of us. 
in Ecclesiastes 3.14, I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. God doeth it, and that should, and men should fear before him. So the idea here is, is that if he fixes it, he fixes it permanently. Are you waiting for an angel to come into your life and stir up the waters? Or are you willing to take Jesus at his word? That's a question you don't have to raise your hands. I'll leave it up there, okay? Are you still earnestly desiring? See, his healing was instantaneous. It was complete. And it was forever. Okay. Whose faith brought about the healing? It wasn't his. He wanted it, yes. But the faith, it was it's interesting. If you watch certain television programs, you get the impression that if you not heal, it's your fault for not having enough faith. I'm not going to go there. Paul didn't. Paul had a thorn in his flesh that didn't. We can go down a whole other path there at another time. And immediately the man was made whole, took up his bed and walked, and on the same day, uh oh, was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, It is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. The legalists come out. The procedural specialists. It's, you're not allowed to do these things on a Sabbath day. What was the punishment? What was the punishment for breaking the Sabbath? Death. Death, believe it or not. Okay. It was unlawful to carry a bed on the Sabbath, especially in Jerusalem. The punish was, punishment that was supposed to be administered was death by stoning. It didn't always, but it was considered very serious. And uh, according to the Mishnah, by the way, a man could not be accused of violating the Sabbath unless he had been first formally warned against such an action. But still, the point is it's a big deal here. And so, the, 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 and so immediately the man was made whole and he took up his bed and walked. Same day. The Jews therefore said unto him, it was cured. It is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. Now, when John uses the term the Jews, that gives rise to a widespread misunderstanding. John uses that phrase to refer to the leadership of the Jews. But there, that led to a lot of anti-Semitic writings in the early church that caused a lot of, that's one of the things that led to the anti-Semitism, the Jews that killed our Messiah and all that business. It wasn't the the Jews that killed the Messiah. It was the Romans, number one, because they didn't have the authority. But the one that killed the Messiah was me. It's my fault. It was my sins that put him on that tree. So, but the, the, the term Jews, if you don't recognize it's referring to the leadership, it, it, it leads to a lot of misunderstandings. Okay. So, now the Pharisees, the legalists, had the power of the religious bureaucracy in those days. When you get to the book of Acts, it shifts. The Sadducees, the liberals take over. But during the gospel period, the Pharisees had the dominant role in the Sanhedrin. And, uh, but it's the Sadducees and Acts that are the dominant p political power. And uh, It's interesting that the religious world opposes Christ most fiercely. The bondage of traditions are always the adversaries of whatever traditions. Be careful with that one. Anyway, he answered them and says, He that made me, they, they, they get hold of him and said, He that, uh, who did this? He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. And they asked him, What man is that which said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? And he that was healed wist not who it was. For Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. And there was a crowd. Jesus went on. The guy didn't know who did it. He didn't know who did it. He's just the beneficiary of it. He wasn't healed because he knew who Jesus was or agreed. He just consented. It's not quite the same thing. Okay. Afterward, Jesus finds him in the temple and said to him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come, up, come unto thee. Then the man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus that made him whole. See, then he knew who it was, and so he reports it as he was instructed to. And uh, so Jesus finds him. Again, he's always he got the initiative here. And... Uh, the word, Jesus finds it, it's, it's the same Greek word that we get the word heuristics from. Heuristics is the, the procedure to discover for yourself kind of thing. And uh, that's our goal in teaching, is to be heuristic, to get you to discover for yourself these things. Anyway, Jesus found the guy is the point, okay. 
But he tells him, sin no more. That implies that his problem was a result of his sin. That fits the metaphor, in us being in his place, but it also implies that it isn't always true. Sometimes some can have an incapacity for some other reason. But in this case, we know it was um, because of sin. And uh, the volitional sin, in other words. Therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. But Jesus answered and said, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. Now they sought to kill him over all this. And, uh, and the, these uh, tenses, the verb tenses here are imperfect, meaning they began and continued, if you will. And two years from this verse, they succeed, killing him. And so, uh, now, my father, interesting, interesting. Um, whenever the Pharisees get upset, they're there to let us Gentiles know something's important. That's the, I think, it, Jesus answered, my father worketh hitherto and I work. They're really upset about that phrase. O the, the my father. See, the Pharisees, Pharisees understand what he's saying. He is making himself equal with God. We may miss that, but they didn't. They understand the significance of what he said. Declaration of deity. We're going to see th uh, three of them here. Equal with God in nature, verses 17 and 18. Equal with God in power, 19 and 21. Equal with God in authority, 17 and 18. He was Lord of the Sabbath. Sabbath was made for man, not for God. And the Father does not get tired. He didn't rest on the seventh day. He imposed a rest on the creation for the creation's sake, not his. And that's a whole other study. Therefore the Jews sought more to kill him because not only had he spoke, broken the Sabbath, but he said that God was his Father making himself equal with God. They, the Pharisees explained that for us, for our understanding. His Father. And uh, it, the, the, the Greek word there is where we get the, 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 it's an idiom, it's a unique expression of the Father. And uh, the strongest statement of his deity always comes from his enemies. Have you ever noticed that? Judas says, I betrayed innocent blood in Matthew 27. And Pilate also declares him officially innocent, interestingly enough. Everybody misses that. Then they answered Jesus and said to them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. It's also going to be equal with God in power in the next couple of verses. The Father loveth the Son and showeth him all things that himself doeth, and he will show him greater works than these that ye may marvel. But as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth in them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. Wow. Okay. The word loveth there, by the way, is not agape. That shocks him. Yeah, anybody knows the Greek? That's shocks It's phileo. Because it's a relationship between equals. Jesus never acted independently of the Father. Okay. I'll be about my Father's business, he says. He did that in the temptation of the devil. My meats to do the will of him who sent me. Gethsemane is another example where he sweats blood, trying to get out from under, but nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Jesus should be our example in all of those. And uh, this rebukes the self-will in all of us. That rebukes the self-will in all of us. Accepting Jesus Christ is a moment-by-moment -moment commitment to be under the Father's will, moment by moment. When we do, God can then direct us. When we don't, <laughs> we mess up. It's that simple. It takes us a while to learn that the hard way. Well, the final equal with God is with authority. God, the Father judges no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. They, he that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. The word there is committed. The token, the perfect act of indicative, emphasizing completion. It's a done deal. And, uh, okay, the Son is worthy of the same worship and so forth. Putting him first in every area. He doesn't want to be first on a list of ten. He wants to be list number one on a list of one. It's a difference. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. 
have everlasting life. Wow. Present possession, you have it now. It's not something you get later. By hearing and believing, you already have eternal life. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. Interesting thing here. Giving life as the Son of God. Judgment, however, as a son of man because our is our kinsman redeemer. And he's earned that right. There's an allusion to two resurrections coming. Marvel not at this. The hour is coming in which they that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life. And they that have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. Wow, there are two resurrections. We find that dis- discriminated in Revelation 20. A whole study on that. One is the resurrection of life. We all know about that. We embrace that. We're excited about it. Many of don't bother to understand there's another resurrection too. The resurrection of damnation. Two. Those that are born twice die once. Those that are born once die twice. Twice dead. Well, we've got four witnesses coming, and then we wrap it up. I can, I can of my own self do nothing as I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. To be a little more correct in the translation, I, if I bear witness of myself, ye will say, my witness is not true. That's what he's going to rebut here in what follows. Two witnesses are always required. That's all the way through the, both Old and New Testament. The fourfold witness, John the Baptist, his works, the Father, and the Scriptures. Those are four that he's going to highlight for us as four witnesses of testifying as to who he is. Okay, let's take the first one, John the Baptist. Jesus says, there is another that beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesseth of me is true. Ye sent unto John, and he bear witness unto the truth. But I receive not testimony from man, but these things I say that ye might be saved. That's where we started, John, in chapter 1, if you may recall. Okay. And again, the basis of two more witnesses. Let's take the next one, is works. Speaking of John, he was a burning and shining light, and ye were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. But I have a greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me, that the Father hath sent me. And so... And so the uh, you know, John the Baptist was uh, was uh, not uh, used a different term for light. He was a light bearer, not the light. It's a small point, but we'll go on here. The works is the key issue here. Works are not necessarily miracles, by the way. The words he's referring to here the work, uh, are messianic works depicted in Daniel nine, verse twenty-four, which passage is the key to all Bible prophecy. If you study the seventy weeks of Daniel, v- verse four is his summarizes all his works there. And at the interest of time, I'll let you dig that out. 9.24 gives you the list. We'll be talking more about that later anyway. The next one is the Father himself. And the Father himself which hath sent me hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his shape, and ye have not his word abiding in you, for whom he hath sent him ye believe not. The Father himself is the next witness. And then finally, perhaps the most tangible to all of us is the scriptures themselves, the word. John 5.39, key memory verse. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. The scriptures. And by the way, he's really talking about, the, he's talking about all the scriptures, but he's focusing on the Old Testament. Now, and he says, search the scriptures. And the Greek word is like that which you'd stalk, like stalking game, if you will. Searching for a treasure, maybe. And so you know, he's, he's, he's talking about getting into the Old Testament, really getting into it. They all testify by Jesus. Jesus quotes Psalm 40, verse 7, The volume of the book is written of me, he says. He's on every page. And uh, John 17, he's going to elaborate on that when we get there. A couple of treasures coming, and then we wrap it up. And ye will not come to me that ye might have life, I receive not honor from men, but I know you that ye have not the love of God in you. I am come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. Wow. 
Verse 43 there is a dandy. That's a prediction of the Antichrist. I've come, my own name. I've come in my Father's name, he didn't receive me. Another's going to come in his name and him you will receive. That's alluding to the ultimate world leader that will cause all kinds of havoc. Coming world leader. He has 33 titles in the Old Testament. He has 13 in the New. The one we usually use about him is one that isn't used about him. The word Antichrist is only used by John in his epistles in a different sense. In the book of Revelation, he doesn't use that. He uses several other terms. But that's the thing that we all use, so we'll not fight that. How does the Antichrist, this coming world leader, somehow bring all world religions together? You might think about it. It's a great discussion question. Him they will receive. Okay, let's wrap it up. How can ye believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom ye trust. He's talking to Pharisees now. That was their, the guy on the pedestal. Moses is the one that's going to condemn you. For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me. Get this one, gang, for he wrote of me. Those five words are precious because he just saved you hours of boring library research. When I was a very enthusiastic teenager, learning the Bible, getting into it, all taking the Bible very seriously, I came across the, the real scholarship, the documentary hypothesis. Well, Moses didn't really write the Torah. And uh, I got into that, what's called that documentary hypothesis. And uh, let me see if I got it. Anyway, he's saying here that if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? Jesus points out the writings of Moses will accuse him, is the point. And so, Higher, Wellhausen and some others, a bunch of scholars got around, and they decided that in the Torah, the use of Elohim as a name, Elohim as a name for God is, was the, the one writer. Another writer seemed to use Yahweh more. And they started partitioning with great scholarship how the Torah really was written by five different guys under the name of Moses. And there was the, they argued about which one were the Eloists and which one was the Yahwists or the Deuteronomists and uh, priestly. You can find books written as they argue about the details, being wrong about them all, by the way, for a lot of reasons. Because uh, without getting, and you'll find documents that speak of the document about the E documents, the J documents, the D documents. And it's all nonsense. It's all nonsense. Why? How do I know that Moses wrote it? Not these turkeys. Because Jesus just told me. There are over 20 places in the Gospels that Jesus attributes the writings of Moses to Moses. Don't waste your time on pseudo-scholarship. You get caught up with these guys and, and it, it's, it's tragic. There are numerous fallacies in their writings. The self-contradictions just shred it. You can actually, if you want to get into it, you can, but you realize that what they're doing is making Jesus a liar. So don't waste your time. Don't waste your time. Okay, so we made it pretty close. For the next session, I want you to prepare by reading. We'll take one chapter next time. It's the longest chapter in John, John 6. And you're going to ask you questions like, what does it mean when he claims to be the bread of life? What does that really mean? We'll talk about some of those things. And so with that, let's bow our hearts for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word has authenticated itself. As we search the scriptures, we know that we have eternal life and it comes from you. We thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you for this time together. Our prayer is, Father, that your purpose be accomplished in each of our lives as we commit ourselves into your hands without any reservations whatsoever. 